Well, good morning. We're glad that you are here today and glad we are in here today rather than the Life Center and hopefully it's a little cooler in here as well. Um, I, I know that we, you know, we continue to be in the wilderness as far as churches and COVID and everything and your guess is as good as mine. Uh, how long this thing's going to last? I, I have no idea. I have no idea. Um, what we can do is just continue to do what we've been asked to do, which is to um, wear masks when we're supposed to wear masks, take temperatures, which we're going to continue to do that. I've had people tell me they feel safe coming to Emory to worship because of what we do. We'll continue doing that. Oh, that was ominous. Right <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I was expecting so that's like a horror movie no, you know. Really. Oh boy. Um, so I mean we'll just continue doing what we're supposed to do. Um, you know, and I told the folks at 930, you know, you you um, you know, you may think that all this is a big hoax and all this. You know, and I've said it almost every Sunday, has it been overhyped? I think it has. But we also know that there have been people that have died. We don't know how many, just because I think even those numbers are suspect. Uh, but what I think that that calls for us to have is just caution. It's just caution, and we'll continue to do that. Um, I did mention the other service as well. I, uh, I, probably, I probably like John MacArthur a little bit too much. I mean, y'all know that. I refer to him a lot, and uh, he probably wouldn't like that, just reading him and understanding him. But this week, his church put out a thing. You know, he's in California, and the governor there has, has basically forbade churches from gathering for months. And then he, the governor let off on restaurants and different things and let them go ahead and do, but he continued the church's thing. And then... No singing, and I mean, it just so finally, he and his elders met there, and they he put out a very respectful statement that said that they were going to meet today. Uh, and I was just reading a second ago that the government has threatened them with shutting the power off to the church if they meet today. Um, somehow, I don't think that's going to stop them from meeting. I really don't. I think they'll they'll find a way, but. Um, it, you know, and, and will we ever get there? I have no idea. I, what I have learned during this time is to learn not to make definitive statements about, well, Mississippi would never do that. I'm not going to say that. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, and I've told you before that if it seemed like that the governor was saying churches can't meet just because he didn't want churches to meet, when would we meet? That night. We would call a meeting that night. I don't think our governor would do that. Um, but we need to pray uh, and continue because I, I can tell you this as well, that God is not in heaven wringing his hands distraught over what's occurring because of this. He's not doing that. Nor should we. We should put our faith and trust in him and we'll do that. So first song, let's jump into it. We're going to sing All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. And you'll find the words there on, on, um, on, the, on the screen there, our wall. So here we go.
I need y'all to sing out. <laughs> we had Chad in the last service, and it was really good. He was able to sing, and he was basically leading from the rear. I love that. <laughs> it was great. It was great. We're going to sing Nothing But the Blood. Nothing But the Blood. We all know this one. That third verse, Jeff, can you pull that? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> third verse back up. There we go. When it says there, look at that. Nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Naught of good that I have done, nothing but the blood of Jesus. It's almost like the Apostle Paul wrote that song. It really is. Thanks, Jeff. I appreciate it. This morning, we will be back in Galatians in the second chapter I was, as I was reading this week uh, and, and just looking at this chapter again, I, I remember back a long time ago, we were living in Shreveport. Uh, it was probably, oh, I don't know, 1986 or seven. That's how it's a long time ago. But uh, and Carolyn reminded me during the first service that this was her idea, and it was. Um, our kids were real young and we wanted them to be able to swim and so uh, she started looking for a place that had a pool. She and a friend of hers were doing that. So um, she found a place and I mean it had a very large pool. We got to go a couple of times and loved it. I mean it was just it was a massive pool, lots of kids, lots of young families and uh, 
you got to go two times, but then you had to join this club to be able to continue going at that point. It, it, was, um, it was the Elks Club in Shreveport. I didn't know anything about the Elks, but you know, at that, at that point I was, uh, uh, oh, let's see. If I tell you I was impulsive, would that surprise you? Um, uh, but I was making definitive statements to Carolyn. Well, I'm, I'm not going to swear allegiance to anything but Jesus and, you know, just just all that kind of stuff because I did not want to go to some organization and have to learn a secret handshake and just secret code words and different things to do that. And so I went that night and realized yeah, all I had to do was go to one meeting. And, and what... What they were, the Elks Club was doing is they were using the pool to try to grow their membership. Because there, it was a thing where, for the most part, there was a section of young men who were in the meeting, and then there was a section of older men who had been members for numbers and numbers of years. And so we were able to go. But I did have to go to that one meeting. And I did have to recite some, you know, some of the beliefs of the Elks Club, which were good and noble things. They did a lot of things in the Shreveport community that were very good. Um, but I had to go through this process to be able to do it. And at the end of it, I could say, I did this. I did this. I began to think about that in relationship to becoming a part of the body of Christ. Do you understand that to become a part of the body of Christ, you have to be willing to admit that you are an abject failure when it comes to the gospel. The church is the one organization that it's impossible for you to qualify for. In fact, you have to be willing to say, I'm, in, I'm, I'm unqualified to be a member of this organization. And if you won't do that, you can't join. You, you saying that you need Jesus is telling the world that you're a failure. Now, I'll be honest with you. I know a lot of people that are members of churches that would never admit that. Because to admit that would be to admit that there is a need that they cannot do to fulfill. And... Because we live in a uh, representative republic, we're not a democracy, right? We are not a democracy. Uh, it's not one man, one vo woman, one vote, and we rule by democracy. We, that's not the case. We live in a representative republic for a state. We do the same thing as far as the federal government goes. You don't like how they vote? What do you need to do? Vote them out. I mean, that's, that's the beauty of the republic that we live in. But because we live and we, we do have some democratic type principles, we think that that also applies to the gospel. Folks, it doesn't. You and I, before Jesus Christ, what rights do we have? None. We have no rights. And that doesn't fly very well in most places. We, we serve completely at the sovereign will of God. And that's hard for us. Because I want my way. And, and so we don't tend to deal with authority that well at all. And so anyway, but for you and me to become a part of the body of Christ, we've got to be willing to say that. Can I tell you this? That's sort of what was going on there in Antioch when Paul wrote the book of Galatians. Those Galatian believers had been taught by the Apostle Paul that the gospel was enough, that Jesus living, dying, raising on the third day was absolutely enough to redeem me out of my sin. And that was the hope that I had. Then we know this other group comes in called the Judaizers. We've been mentioning them a lot, but they come in and say, you know what, Paul, you're just a B-teamer. Just, just let me, let's help you a little bit. Let, let's just make sure you get it right because you're not on the A-team of the, of the apostles. You're on the B-team. You're on the B-team. 
So they begin to tell those believers there that, you know, you, you are believers, but you know what? You need to make sure that you keep the law first, and then you'll be that perfect Christian. Jesus plus anything equals what? Nothing. 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 Jesus plus nothing equals everything. everything. So if you and I think for a moment that we can add something because I'm so smart, I've got four degrees, God, you need me. In fact, you need me to, to do everything just right to add a little bit to what Jesus did. Does that not sound ridiculous? It is ridiculous. It is. And look, Paul... Paul, he, he had a fear in him, but his fear was primarily toward Jehovah. He feared God above everything else, and because he did, he didn't fear human beings in the least. He spoke to govern, government officials the same way he would talk to a child in the faith or even leaders that came from Jerusalem. There was no compromise in the man, none whatsoever. And I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for that because compromise was very easy then and it's easy now. We've talked about Peter a number of times. Remember Peter had come to Antioch just to check it out, see what was going on. Paul had, Paul had been there. He'd been preaching the gospel there. The church had been growing there. Peter comes just to see what's happening. And one of the main things that's occurring there is that Gentiles and Jews are sitting at a table eating together was absolutely forbidden in Old Testament law. Remember, the Jews saw a Gentile as a dog, an unclean animal, and would never violate or defile their table with Gentiles. So he comes in, and, and, and Peter just jumps in, and he's eating with Gentiles and Jews as well. He's fine with that until these other men come from Jerusalem, and he gets scared. Peter, Peter has a fear of man at that point. But you understand, with Peter being a leader in the church, what do you think all of those believers at Antioch thought when Peter got up and he went from one side of the fellowship hall to the other side of the fellowship hall? You know, Peter was basically telling them that the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus wasn't sufficient. That it actually took keeping the law. It's frightening what was happening. Because remember, Peter had already been in Jerusalem when Paul had come and brought Titus. And the church said, yeah, this is good stuff. No reason for Titus to become a Jew at this point. He is a follower of Jesus. So in effect, when Peter got up, he was nullifying the grace of God. Look at verse 21 in chapter 2. Paul wrote on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. If I were picking the most important verse in Galatians, that would be it. That, you know, that would be it. That's pretty strong stuff there that, that Paul is writing there. And I'm, I'm thinking maybe he had Peter in mind when he wrote that. So let's look at our text today. We're going to look at three things. This first one is, is Christ a minister of sin? Is Christ a minister of sin? And so uh, in reading the text, he says... But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Wow, that's, that's, uh, that's quite a strong question there. Remember what Paul is doing, though. Paul is combating these Judaizers um, because the actions of Peter and these other Christians there had, had sent shockwaves through that church family. And sent shockwaves through it. So, um, you know, what if, what if, um, and I've mentioned this before, if I told you, you know, if, if, uh, 
if Sherry had come to me and said that she wanted to be a believer in Jesus. And I said, well, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. And I said, but you know, Sherry, there's something that we've got to do first. And, you know, I'll have four or five people there meet me here on Sunday morning. And what we're going to do is we're going to baptize you first and then you can become a Christian. Well, I know she wouldn't do that, but I'm just saying if, if, if she were an unbeliever and she had come to church one Sunday and I told her that, you know what the thing is? She would trust me. I'm the pastor of the church. Now, what if everybody else in here began to see what was happening and what, what I was doing was I was making people get baptized before they became followers of Jesus. There's some people here at this church that would question whether or not they're really Christians. Why? Because I'm the pastor of the church. Now, it's completely foreign to Scripture, obviously. But what was happening in Antioch was the people there, those believers there, saw Peter, the head of the church, supposedly, in Jerusalem. And he has gotten up from the table and he's walked over to another table where only Jews were. So those Gentile believers in Antioch were thinking, well, maybe Jesus shedding his blood and raising on the third day really isn't enough. Do you understand how confused they probably were? Because Peter had done this. It's frightening there. And so Paul reasons in this way. He says there, then, well, look, if the Gentiles then have to go back and keep the law before they can become Christians, then what's also probably true then is that Peter and Barnabas and even I are in sin. Why is that? Well, because Peter and Barnabas and Paul had been sitting with other Gentiles in eating, not keeping the law. So Paul throws himself back into this category then of sinner. And if that's true, then who else had said it really wasn't what you ate that defiled you, it what, it's what comes out of your mouth? Who said that? Jesus. So is Jesus then a minister of sin? There's a great reason. Paul is saying, if this is sin and Jesus has said it's okay, then he is a minister of sin. <laughs> I mean, it's not funny, but, but that's exactly what Paul is arguing there. Notice what, how Paul responds to that question. He's anticipating a negative answer there. I mean, this is a rhetorical question, but he is expecting an answer. So look at how he answered it. In my translation, there in verse 17, at the end of verse 17, my translation says, certainly not. If you've got a King James Bible, it says, God forbid. One translation says, may it never be so. Absolutely not is how the NIV translated it. Paul said in no uncertain terms, this is absolutely ridiculous there. And, and, and basically, Paul is also saying there that just because somebody is a believer in Christ and has received his grace, it doesn't give him or her the ability to go out and live however they want to live. We've had this conversation before. I know why the Methodist Church rejects the concept of eternal security. Because you've got millions of people claiming to be Christians that live like the devil every single day and calling themselves saved. I get that. And I can tell you this clearly and definitively. I believe in eternal security. But I also believe that my life is going to reflect the gospel of Christ as well. 
If, if I tell you that I'm, that I'm saved and I'm eternally secure and there's no desire to be in the Word of God, there's no desire to worship, there's no desire for me to pray, there's no desire for me to tell other people about Jesus Christ, that man is a liar and the truth is not in him. Amen? Amen. You all know people that say they're Christians and their life doesn't reflect Jesus Christ at all. Can I tell you that Paul said, I am what? Crucified with Christ. If you're a believer in Jesus, you understand that Jesus Christ crucified you and that you died and he now lives in you. Jesus can't be in a place and not make a difference. It's not going to happen. You tell me, well, he hadn't made a difference in my life, then you're not a believer. Can I say that definitively? Yeah, I can, because if you look at, if you look at Galatians 2.20, that's what the gospel says. The gospel changes people from the inside out. The reason that many people reject eternal security is because some of the very worst advertisements for Christianity are Christians. Amen? You know, you tell me that you tell me that uh, you, you know, you don't eat junk food and yet I see you in the line of McDonald's every day. There's something not quite right there. You tell me that, you know, you, you think Domino's Pizza is the best but you're always going to Pizza Hut. That, that there's a problem there. Where am I heading with this? You tell me that you're a follower of Jesus, but you have no desire to be in the Word of God. You have no desire to sing praises to Him like we did this morning. You have no desire to pray. You have no desire to, to publicly worship Him with His body. You shouldn't be claiming to be a Christian if those things are true in your life. But what we've done in America, we've made Christianity just praying a prayer and asking Jesus into your heart. It doesn't say that anywhere in Scripture. It says to take up your cross, deny yourself, and what? Follow Him. So can I ask you this morning, are you following Him? Are you following him? Philip Ryken, one of the men that I, that I read, has said this. It has to be admitted that some Christians are not the best advertisements for Christianity. A great line. Martin Luther wrote, and Luther's another one, that uh, probably the single best commentary in Galatians that's ever been written. He wrote this, a Christian is not someone who has no sin or feels no sin. He is someone to whom, because of his faith in Christ, God does not impute his sin. You may say, well, what does that mean, impute his sin? That's a fair question. To impute sin means that when you and I become followers of Jesus, God takes that sin off of us and he places it on the person of Jesus Christ, not just at the time of your rebirth, not just at the time of your redemption, but every sin after that, God takes and puts it on Jesus. So you tell me that you can sin all you want to? No, sir. You don't understand the cost of your sin and my sin. Because when we sin, God takes that sin and puts it on the Lord Jesus every single time. So God doesn't impute that sin to us. He puts it on Jesus. Secondly, Paul says in our outline, I am crucified with Christ. Notice there in verse 20, it says there, I have been crucified 
with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul uses a, a, a great verb here. Um, he, he uses a verb here, and the, the, what it means is this, that there was an action in the past that had continuing results even to the present. So like, the, like the, when Jesus said, it is finished, the, the literal translation of that phrase is, it has been finished with the result that it is. That's a perfect tense in English. It's a perfect tense in Greek, in Latin. Uh, most of those kinds of languages have that same idea of a past act with a continuing result. So when, when it says there that I am crucified with Christ, the literal translation is I have been crucified with Christ with the result that I am. There's a past action with a continuing result there. What that tells me is that when a person is truly redeemed, that they're going to stay redeemed. And if a person is acting like they've come to faith in Jesus, but they wander off and never come back, then they were never saved in the first place. The perfect tense has that idea there. So when Paul says that, he was crucified with the result that he still is crucified. And can I tell you this? If you just merely intellectually telling me you believe that is not enough. Our churches are filled with people. If I were to say to you, do you believe that Jesus lived? Hands go up. Yeah. Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross? Hands go up. Do you believe he rose on the third day? Hands, yeah, it goes up. Those are all great things. But if there's not evidence in your life that that belief has changed you, you, you need to be careful. And you need to make sure that that's not just merely some intellectual belief that you have. See, Paul understood he, he understood that his absolute identification was in Christ. You know, right now, um, and, and it will be from now on probably, identity theft is, I mean, it's just all the time, every day, isn't it? I mean, you hear about it, and there, there are companies that have sprung up just to help with those things, and I'm, and I'm glad for that. When we talk about identity theft, when we talk about that, where somebody actually steals your identity, it's one thing. But when you identify yourself with Jesus, you are taking his identity. And when somebody says to you, who are you? Our answer really ought to be, I am crucified with Christ. I no longer live. He lives in me. How, what rights do you have as a Christian? You don't have any rights, nor do I. We serve at the pleasure of our Lord and our Savior. See, Paul understood that. Paul had died to an entire way of life, and he makes this comment, I live, but no longer I. His death to the old way meant an entry into the new way of life, and Paul absolutely understood that. This, you know, this idea of faith for Paul wasn't just a Sunday morning thing where he came and sang a couple of songs, listened to a sermon, and the rest of the week lived however he wanted to live and never had another thought about the gospel. It was a 24-7 for him. Everything that he did, everything that he did revolved around the Lord Jesus. You know, when... Paul finishes this thought here 
Look at, look at that verse again in verse 20. It says there that the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He surrendered himself on my behalf. He finishes that thought with that idea, saw the persecutor on the Damascus road. When he met the Son of God he, who was crucified for him, that event completely transformed the life of Paul. Can I ask you that question? Is your life transformed because you say you believe in Jesus? Or is it just a socially acceptable thing here in the South that you come to church and that's what we do here? You know, I have been railing against the evangelical church ever since I stepped foot here. Because I believe our churches are filled with people that don't know Jesus, whose lives have not been changed, who don't care about him except for an hour time slot on a Sunday morning. That's not transformation, and that's not crucifixion. If you really want to know who you are, if you really want to understand your identity, if you want to have a healthy self-image, then you must understand that to have a healthy self-image, it comes from you first being right with God, and secondly, you finding God's purpose for your life. Anything else will lead you down a path of disillusionment, of discouragement, and depression. It will. Amen? Have you been there? I have. I have. Thirdly, did Christ die needlessly? You know, that's a terrible thing even to, uh, that's really a terrible thing even to say out loud in, in, in one sense. But that's sort of Paul's point as he ends this chapter there with verse 21. He finishes the chapter with that thought, I don't nullify God's grace. Nullifying God's grace would be you thinking that maybe God needed a little help in saving you. Can I tell you what, what this does? It destroys pride. Look over in Ephesians 2. Galatians, Ephesians, set right after Galatians in, in Ephesians 2. And you know these, this verse. The thing about the gospel is that if you are honest, it destroys pride completely. Beginning in verse 8, he says, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the what? The gift of God. And the King James says, Lest anyone should what? Boast. Boast. It, it just rips out pride. When we come to the cross, there's no room for pride. There's no room for self. There's no room there for self. So when Paul says this in verse 21, he says there, I don't nullify the grace of God. I don't make it to, to no effect. And for you and I to put our trust, for you and me to put our trust in ourselves, we nullify God's grace. What, what Paul is trying to tell us all through this chapter, all through Galatians, is that the way of grace and the way of works are diametrically opposed to one another. Now, you might say, well, you know, I'm believing in grace that much. That Again, that gives you freedom to go out and live however you want to live. You know, if, if you think that, you don't understand the gospel. And I can see where if a person believed in the eternal security, but they did not have an understanding of the cross and sanctification, it might lead there. I, I get that. But that is not what Paul is talking about here. 
the Judaizers who opposed Paul, they continued to say that keeping the law is how somebody obtained salvation. And you knew, you knew that they thought that that's really what was important. Can I tell you this though? If becoming a Christian is about saying the right formula to a prayer, but getting it just right, if, if becoming a Christian is about baptism, or it's about you uh, living a certain way to get holy enough to become a Christian, you understand all those things basically say Jesus didn't need to die. It just took you getting good enough to be a Christian. It, it, what this does, it eliminates pride. Because when we look at what Jesus did See, here's the thing. On your worst day, Jesus knew the sin you would commit. And he still died on the cross for you anyway. There ain't nobody loves you like that. Nobody. A couple of quotes and then we'll be through. This is, this is from Martin Luther. He wrote this, It is an intolerable blasphemy to think that you or I could somehow please God with our attempts at righteousness. God cannot be appeased or placated except by this immense, infinite price, the death and the blood of the Son of God, one drop of which is more precious than all of creation. Love that quote. And then the last quote. I think if, if you picked up a note sheet, it's on there. If you or I add to the works of the law, to, to the sacrifice of the cross, then we make a mockery of Jesus' death. Just like the soldiers who spat on him, the thieves who insulted him, and those who yelled at him to come down from the cross. That is so very true. You think you can be good enough to become a Christian? You think that it, it took you just doing a certain ritualistic kind of thing to be holy enough to become that? That's no different than what he endured on that day. The only thing that could redeem us was the blood. Nothing but the blood. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for this day that you have given us. Lord, we, we come to you just acknowledging our inability to please you outside of the blood of your Son. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here that is doubting their redemption, Lord, that even today, that that would be resolved. Lord, remind us that we don't just need the death and the burial and resurrection of Jesus on the day that you redeem us. Lord, we need it today. We don't keep ourselves saved. Just like you shut the door to the ark. Lord, you keep us saved. And that gives us great confidence. Not in our abilities, not in how smart we are, or what job we have, whatever it might be. We're thankful today that you and you alone are our security. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.